It's July, so uh, let's think about Christmas for a minute. As I was preparing to conclude our series in the book of Malachi this week, two Christmas songs that came to mind. There, I had I, probably eight or ten songs that running through my head as I was preparing, but two of them were Christmas songs. And uh, one of them I'm going to talk about in the message, but the other one is a carol that you wouldn't necessarily sing in church, but is eerily parallel to our scripture focus for this morning. It goes something like this. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. There are people who think that ought to be my theme song. I don't agree. Uh, Now, why would I think about a song that seemingly defeats the message of Christmas while working through an Old Testament prophet in the middle of the summer? Well, that song tells us that there's going to be two kinds of children on Christmas morning, right? And who of you parents have not at some point used that as a, well, either a carrot or a two-by-four, I'm not sure which. Um, And our scripture focus this morning suggests that God has a similar pair of lists denoting two different kinds of people in eternity, though the consequences are decidedly different. If you're intrigued, stay tuned. If you're intrigued, don't walk out the door early. Good morning. My name is Jeff Loach. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul's Church, and I welcome you who are worshiping with us online from near and from far. You can hit the like and the subscribe and the notification bell to stay in the loop with us. And feel free to leave a comment in the live stream, or you can use the connection card. It's in paulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and we'll be glad to uh, be in touch. And to you who are here, welcome. Glad that you're here. Uh, I look forward to conversation with you outside when the service is through. I want to say welcome to Roderick, who is our substitute pianist, filling in for Paul, who is uh, enjoying an anniversary getaway with his wife Tracy this weekend. And uh, next Sunday, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So you who are here or are coming, please remember to bring your elements with you. Uh, If you forget, we will have some spares for you here. And for you who are at home, feel free to uh, bring your, uh, have your your juice and your bread ready uh, for our time together in the Lord's table. We're going to worship the Lord together. If you're in the room, please stand if you're able, and we'll open up the heavens.
Today's lesson is taken from John chapter 8, verses 31 to 47. Jesus and Abraham. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean? You will be set free. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there is no room in your hearts for my message. I am telling you what I saw when I was with my father. You are following the advice of your father. Our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied, for if you were really children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father. They replied, we aren't illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and his father lies. So when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the word of God, but you don't listen because you don't belong to God. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you that Jesus came to be the way and the truth and the life, that he came to set us free, that we would be free indeed. And in freedom this morning, Lord, we praise you. We confess that sometimes we just think we've been set free, and yet we live in bondage, whether to a false sense of identity or money or the notion that good works can save us. Forgive us for deluding ourselves into thinking we are free. Remind us that only by the righteousness of Jesus and our faith in him are we set free. Help us to know your truth and thereby to be set free to love and to serve you as we serve others in the world. And remind us that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for your healing work in the lives of many. Thinking of Marv and John this morning. And we pray for those who yet need your healing. And we remember Don and ask you to meet him in his point of need in Jesus' name. We pray for those whose hearts are longing for they know not what. Reveal yourself to them by your grace and Enable them to reach out to you in faith, you whose hand is already extended in their direction. We pray for pastors and churches where the word is rightly preached and the sacraments are truly celebrated. Encourage them in this season of difficulty 
and remind us that no matter who is in Ottawa or Toronto, Jesus is still on the throne of heaven and his kingdom will come and it will be wonderful. Keep us focused on the prize to come, we pray. And as we turn to your word this morning, Father, open us fully that we will hear you speaking to each of us in the depths of our hearts. We need you often more than we realize. So minister to us today, we ask, in the powerful name of Jesus, by his Holy Spirit. Amen. You've probably heard that over a week ago, the town of Lytton, B.C. was about 90% destroyed by a fire. It had been in the news the week before because it had hit a record high temperature for the country, something around 50 degrees. We think we got a bad. Of course, they say it's a dry heat. Well, heat is heat as far as that goes. But sadly, it wasn't the weather that set the fire. It was apparently set by people. But imagine being a resident of Lytton, British Columbia, and being told on virtually no notice that you had to evacuate your home and evacuate the community to a safer location. What would you take with you? What would you grab in the scramble of those few minutes? A lot of people chose their pets. Uh, I'm sure some chose items of sentimental value, but I'm sure that no one was able to take everything they would have wished to take uh, so there are memories that likely were destroyed in the charred ruins of the homes of the citizens of Lytton. But this leads us to think about what are our treasured possessions? What are our special treasures? Maybe you have a piece of art or a photo album or a piece of jewelry, something that reminds you of the past, something that if everything else were destroyed, you would want to have to remember those who have gone before, or uh, perhaps that which was lost. In today's scripture focus, we're going to learn what God's special treasure is, and what, what is his treasured possession. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, so what could God possibly treasure more than anything else? Well, we're going to find that out. We're going to look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, through chapter 4, verse 6. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. Now, that scroll of remembrance, is uh, it's also mentioned in the sixth chapter of the book of Esther. That's a, an unusual little Old Testament book that chronicles the story of a queen and is one of the uh, few books of the Bible that actually doesn't mention God, interestingly enough, but it's an interesting part of Hebrew history. So the scroll of remembrance is mentioned in Esther and here in Malachi, and it refers to a Persian record of events or people uh, that are important to the history of a kingdom. It's kind of like a royal diary of a sort. And this is where the people who were righteous were noted. These were the people who feared and honored God. It was a permanent record. Interestingly, negative uh, acts were recorded in less permanent media, I suppose, so they could be forgotten. Verse 17. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. They were his treasured possession. This term wasn't used of other people. So there's your answer. The righteous people of God are God's special treasure treasure. He says, I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see, or know, you know, kind of like I see what you mean. You will see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Now, the next chapter, which in the original language of the Old Testament in the Hebrew is actually just an extension of chapter three. Uh, it begins with an emphatic word that the New Living Translation doesn't translate for us, but it kind of helps to have it there. It connotes a, a sense of immediacy, so we're going to put it in there. This is chapter 4, verse 1. The Lord of heaven's army says, indeed, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. 
On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. So that day of judgment will be the day of the Lord. Some think, oh, is that the first coming of Jesus or the second coming of Jesus? Well, I'm putting my bets on the second coming of Jesus, but it would be a fiery day. The fire of the Lord, of the day of the Lord, is, is a, not a fire of refining like we saw uh, a couple of weeks back where it was saying that, that, you know, you would be refined as through a refiner's fire. This is a consuming fire. The furnace is not the kind you use to heat your house, right? This is more like a blast furnace that we're talking about where nothing and no one connected to the wicked will be spared. Verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Now, if that sentence sounds a little familiar, think about Christmas. Think about Charles Wesley. Given that connection, we tend to think of the son of righteousness as the Lord Jesus. And there's different ways to read or interpret that. I think the idea is that righteousness will become as apparent as the noonday sun. Picture the blinding whiteness of Jesus' garments when he was risen from the dead. Or or think about how hard it is to walk outside after your optometrist appointment when you've had that little test where they have to dilate your pupils and your pupils are like like this big and the sun is just going, like it's going to burn your eyes. Am I the only person who's ever had this test? Thank you. It'll be that obvious, is my point. But often when we think of the Son of Righteousness, we think of the heaven-born Prince of Peace, as Wesley refers to him. Healing in his wings can refer to the rays of the sun or possibly the fold of a garment. It's it's the same term that Jesus uses uh, with the woman uh, with the issue of blood when she touches the hem of his garment and is healed. Now, Mike's going to put up a picture for you to see a little bit more clearly. This is a replica of a painting that is on a a huge painting that's on the wall of a chapel at the archaeological site at Magdala in Israel. And there's, uh, this is an image of that, the woman's hand touching the hem of Jesus' garment. And that wing, the healing in his wings makes the same reference. My wife thought of this as she realized what the text was. So shout out to Diana for thinking of that, because I'd forgotten. But what it connotes here is that this healing will mean there will be no disease, no disaster, no trouble. It's what we tend to think of when we think of heaven, which makes it a great transition, because next week we're going to start a new series on heaven. So we'll carry on the rest of verse 2. And you will go free leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. On the day when I act, you will tread, that is, crush or pummel like newly trodden wine. That that word actually only occurs here in the whole Old Testament. You, You will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. In the Hebrew context, and this works well for us as well, to remember is to obey. When we break God's law, we're not properly remembering it. It's like this. Thursday night, if I remember that tomorrow is garbage day, but I don't actually drag the cans and bins out to the street, remembering that Friday is garbage day, will have done no good, right? To remember is to obey. To remember God's law, decrees, and regulations or judgments is to heed them. Verse 5. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. See, in the New Testament, sometimes Jesus is equated with Elijah, uh, Because Elijah was assumed into heaven, right? If you read the story in Kings of of Elijah the prophet, he he gives his mantle to Elisha, 
and then he's basically carried off in a chariot. He never dies, according to the story. And he's best remembered for standing against Baal worship in, in Israel by the people of God. But in this instance, I think we're not thinking about Elijah being like Jesus as much as Elijah being like John the Baptist, the forerunner, the my messenger of chapter 3, verse 1. Verse 6, his preaching will turn their hearts, turn the hearts of their of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, that sounds like John the Baptist kind of preaching, right? A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. But this is a crummy way to end a book, isn't it? The last word of the book is, a curse. <laughs> to be sure, there's a lot of hope in this passage, but to see the whole prophecy end with the threat of a curse of the, on the people of God is not exactly the happy ending that we long for. But it's important to remember that this is not the end, right? For a couple reasons. One, for the Jewish people, of course, the, the Old Testament for them, their Bible doesn't end with Malachi. Their, their Bible ends with Second Chronicles because they put the law and the prophets and the writings in different order. However, for us, the New Testament picks up where the Old Testament left off 400 years later and fulfills this prophecy. The people who first heard this prophecy were faced with a choice. They could serve the Lord and follow his ways and be counted among the righteous, or they could continue their self-righteous, self-absorbed ways and be counted among the wicked who would be cursed. And in the latter case, the son of righteousness who would rise with healing in his wings would not be for them. This conclusion to the prophecy of Malachi offers a few things I think that we can learn from for our time, and so we're going to spend a minute camping on those. First, there will be a distinction between the righteous and the wicked demonstrated by who serves God and who doesn't. This scroll of remembrance will record their names according to chapter 3, verse 16. The names of those who feared the Lord and always thought about his name. Remembrance always involves names. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, and part of it on its campus is a separate building that is a children's memorial. As you might imagine, it's a very moving experience to go through it. But while the main museum is full of videos and pictures and books of names and artifacts and so forth, uh, the Children's Museum is pitch dark, save for photographs of the children on the walls and a point of light reflected by all of these glass pendants throughout. All you hear is a constant loop of the names, ages, and nations of origin of the children who died in the Holocaust only because they were Jewish. Fully a quarter of the six million Jews who were killed during the Holocaust were children. And to remember the Holocaust is to remember these names. To remember is to obey. Chapter 4, verse 4 reminds the people to obey the law of Moses, all his decrees and regulations. And if we fail to remember, we fail to obey. And even if we do remember but fail to obey, we have not adequately remembered. To be among the righteous, then, is not only to have correct theology, but to have correct practice. We won't be perfect, none of us is. But to be among the righteous, to be among those on, on the scroll of remembrance, we're called to remember and obey as a means of giving glory to God in all things. So think of this. When, when you hear somebody say, well, we're all going to the same place anyway, uh, don't just shrug your shoulders. Understand that there is a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, and that will be determined principally by what we did with Jesus. Second, understand that the fire that comes on the day of the Lord will not be a refining fire, but a consuming fire. 
As I said earlier in chapter 3, the Lord was preparing a refining fire for his people, one that would bring them to righteousness. But to those who resisted, there would be another fire that would come on the day of the Lord, a fire that consumes. Chapter 4, verse 1 says that the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. Now, in part, this is an answer to the complaint in chapter 3, verse 15, that those who do evil prosper. The time will come when the evil will not prosper. So be encouraged. When you face trials, when you're scorned and scoffed at by those who think your faith is as nothing, pray for them that they will meet the Lord before the blast furnace is lit and before they are consumed where there will be nothing left but smoke and ash, though it will be worse for their souls. Does that sound like outdated fire and brimstone preaching? As a good Canadian, I'd like to say I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry because all I'm doing is telling you what the Word of God is saying. And the Scripture is full of these sorts of admonitions to make the choice now. As we're going to learn in our next series, heaven and hell are real and the idea isn't to scare people into the kingdom of God, but to encourage those who are already followers of Jesus to tell other people about the glory of God so that they don't have to experience such an awful, ominous future. The fire on the day of the Lord will not be refining. It will be consuming. On a better note, we learn that the righteous will experience true freedom. Chapter 4, verse 2 says that those who fear the Lord will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. See, a lot of people think that following Jesus is basically about giving up your freedom. It's about allowing ourselves to be constricted by the restraints of religion. But here's the deal. Following Jesus is actually true freedom. As Jesus himself says and. As Janet read earlier, if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. We are set free from sin and set free to follow Jesus with an understanding that the time will come on the day of the Lord when those who are in Christ will experience the truest freedom we can have. Oh Lord, hasten that day. The righteous will experience true freedom And we're made righteous by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It comes as a gift from God that we receive when he gives us grace to believe. Now to prepare for that time, for the day of the Lord, for the judgment that is to come, we need to remember and obey God's decrees. Again, chapter 4, verse 4 tells us that we need to remember and obey the law of Moses, all the decrees and regulations God gave him. And as I mentioned last week, under the new covenant, that law is not rescinded, it's actually heightened. True, we're set free from ritual laws, the laws that God gave his people during the Exodus that were really more for their safety than anything else. But the moral laws, some of which admittedly can make us uncomfortable, especially after Jesus gets hold of them, are still applicable. This is why in the Reformed tradition, we don't ignore the Old Testament because the Old Testament is the foundation on which the New Testament is built. If it's one thing to say we believe and another thing to practice, to remember we must believe and obey. Remember that when you go put your trash out this week. To prepare, remember, and obey God's decrees. Malachi also tells us that there will be a forerunner who will proclaim the need for repentance. Chapter 4, verse 5 tells us that the Lord will send the prophet Elijah. But would it literally be Elijah? The Jews today still leave an empty seat at the Passover table for Elijah. They're expecting him. But as Christians, we believe that he has already come in the person of John the Baptist who preached a baptism of repentance. John came to prepare the way for the Lord. He was the messenger mentioned in 3.1, 1 
who would precede the messenger of the covenant, the son of righteousness, who would come with healing in his wings. John paved the way for his coming, who came not only to, be, to, to bring righteousness, he came to be our righteousness. The Bible says that God took him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When we follow Jesus and obey his word from Genesis to Revelation, we will be among those whose names are written on the scroll of remembrance, whose names are written in the book of life, whose names are written on the roll that's called up yonder. We shall be free and we shall be safe in the everlasting arms of Jesus. So while Malachi ends on a sour note for those who are far from God, the entire book promises hope and encouragement for those who trust him. So let's learn something from the ancient people of Judah. They were in captivity and they cried out to the Lord. They were redeemed from captivity and they forgot the Lord. So the Lord sent his prophet to call the people to repentance and remembrance. And some responded positively. And that remnant kept covenant with God, paving the way for the messenger of the new covenant in whom we have love and life and lasting joy, all found in the Lord Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord will come. So I've got to ask you the question, are you ready? Are you ready for the day of the Lord? Have you committed your life to loving and serving Jesus Christ? Are you reading his word, taking him at his word, reading the Bible? Are you remembering and obeying his decrees? Now, if, if that's not you, let me encourage you in the strongest possible terms to say yes to Jesus today. Embrace his call. Turn from sin. Turn to him in faith. Let the Holy Spirit live in and through you, giving you the strength you need to live for Jesus in a world that's doing everything in its power to keep you from living for Jesus. Follow Jesus with all that you are and all that you have. Go all in with him and for him and live a new life. Now, if you count yourself among the righteous, then go out and tell people about what the Lord has done for you. Tell people of the assurance that you have for eternity because your name is inscribed on that scroll of remembrance. Tell people what it means to be that special treasure, that treasured possession of the Lord. Tell people about the freedom that you have because you experience the son of righteousness. Tell people to join you in remembering and obeying the word of the Lord. Tell people that there is healing in his wings. Because there is. It's not too late. We don't know when it will be. But it's not too late. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that there is healing in Jesus Christ. Healing from sin and estrangement. Healing from pain and sorrow. Healing from sadness and struggle. Thank you for the prophecy of Malachi who has taught us the importance of clinging to you no matter the cost, no matter the pressures that are applied to us. Give us strength, we pray to honor you and serve you in every circumstance. Give us grace to follow the narrow way when it is difficult. And give us peace in knowing that the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Amen. If you responded to God's call today, or if you have any questions you'd like to discuss, feel free to hit me up on the connection cards in Falls Nobleton ca slash connect or of course if you're here we can chat on your way out the door today i'd be glad to follow up with you i'm going to sing a song next that uh, was written by a guy named horatio spafford in response to three great tragedies one was the death of his infant son another was the great fire of chicago of 1871 which was kind of like the one in Lytton, bc but on a much grander scale it actually took away his entire business and then there was the death of his four daughters who drowned on a ship in the Atlantic 
uh, with uh, their mother, but their mother was able to uh, communicate with him and with, by telegraph to say that she was saved alone. Spafford's life came crashing down around him. How did he respond? He wrote this song. Please stand and we'll sing together. Is it well with your soul? Do you have assurance that you are among the righteous by faith in Christ? God calls us to give our all to him in response to his gracious gift in Jesus. And we can give to his mission through any of the means that are posted on the screen, or if you're here, you can leave a gift in the offering plate on your way out in the lobby. Thank you for your continuing faithfulness to God's work through your gifts. 
We're going to close by singing the song I thought might be running through your head through the reading of Malachi and the, and the message this morning from our scripture focus. If you didn't think of it earlier, it should all make sense now to sing a Christmas carol in July. Let's sing and worship the Lord. seems odd to sing a Christmas carol with the air conditioning on, unless you're from Florida, I suppose. But we chose that because of the obvious connections, the son of righteousness, risen with healing in his wings, that Wesley took right from Malachi chapter 4. But I love that carol because it has some of the richest theology of all of hymnody, and people sing it in the mall in December. I hope you'll sing it wherever you go today. And may you go in peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with all of us and those we love today and always.